Vitamin C, these things carry the life force. The fatty nutrients store the life force. They stash them away. The water-soluble nutrients conduct it. That's why they're in water. The, the interaction between water and potassium and water and magnesium and water and thiamine and water in the B-complex and water and vitamin C is electrical. The, wa the, the electrical nutrients, the water-soluble nutrients go right into the water and you get this electrical water, this electrical c conductivity in the water. That's what the BTT is. It's an electrical drink, really. And interestingly, the blood sugar system is intimately connected to this electrical system. But the electrolytes, vitamin C, and the B-complex are incredibly important for sugar metabolism. And this is really important because we urinate, we go to the bathroom, we lose these things. And that makes it much more difficult for the body to process sugar. How do you take care of it? Drink your BTT after you go to the bathroom. Drink your BTT all day long. Drink your BTT first thing in the morning and sip on it. So you get this low, steady state level of electrical nutrients to help your body process sugar. And if you go off the wagon and you eat a bunch of sugar, make sure you do the BTT. You know what? Even just drinking water will help, even without these nutrients. The problem with just drinking water is you're going to go to the bathroom more and then lose the nutrients. But if you fall off the wagon and you drink a bunch of water, you're going to dilute your blood sugar. Water helps improve the way the body processes sugar too. Just be careful if you're drinking lots of water and not replacing those nutrients because you could run into deficiency states. Now, there's other nutrients that are not necessarily, um, not necessarily water soluble that are important for blood sugar control for metabolic syndrome, and these, these tend to be your building nutrients, the ones that are for building. Why? Because historically, through, from an evolutionary perspective, when there was lots of sugar around, there was lots of building going on. This is another very important understanding, uh, another important concept to understand why we're sick. The body equates sugar intake with building because f for eons, for millennia, when we ate sugar, it was the summertime and that's the time to build. There's no sugar in the wintertime. There's no sugar really much of the time at all, but relatively speaking, sugar intake was a summertime phenomena. That's when there was fruit. That's when there was honey, which I think were basically the only types of sugar thousands and thousands of years ago. So the body, summertime's the time for building also. So the body kind of equates sugar from a biochemical standpoint, it equates sugar with building. Well, guess what? We're not building so much these days. You know, we're not lean and mean uh, prototypical human, human beings, Cro-Magnons. That's not us. We're, we're obese, a third of us anyway. We're overweight, probably more. Probably two-thirds of us are obese or overweight. So what's happened is we've got lots of the sugar, and the body thinks it's supposed to be building, so it upregulates all the building stuff, but we're not building. So cholesterol levels go up and blood fats go up and cells start to divide and all the things that happen when we're supposed to be building occur, but we don't build. And this is the problem. This is the relationship between sugar and disease. It's the relationship between sugar and, and cardiovascular disease. Because once blood fats change, they get all dumped into the blood. The body's not using the cholesterol to build cells. It's not using the fats for energy. Now you just got a bunch of fat and cholesterol floating around. That's, that's the link between blood sugar and cardiovascular and, and blood diseases. All right, I'm Pharmacist Ben. We'll be back right after this. Don't go away. Okay, we are back on the bright side, and we do have lines open for you at 844-236-6010, 844-236-6010. We're talking metabolic syndrome, which is an insulin resistance problem that affects one out of three people, they say, probably more. And there's lots of things you could do to protect yourself from it. If you're dealing with any cardiovascular health issues, any, any, any focus on the blood sugar, especially cholesterol. And I don't mean especially cholesterol, but here's the thing about cholesterol. Yeah, cholesterol sticks in the blood, in blood vessels. And when you have too much cholesterol floating in the blood, that's not a good thing. But the question is, why is this happening? Not how do we shut it down? This is absolute insanity, folks. To shut down the cholesterol system of the body is biochemical, medical, therapeutic insanity. It's crazy. If you know anything about how cholesterol works and how the body works, 
I'm not beating anybody up for taking their statin drugs because we don't know any better. Because it's the blind leading the blind. The doctors don't know any better. Do you know your doctors are getting their advice who, where they're getting, not all doctors, but many doctors are getting their, their medical advice from, where they're, they're learning about health from? From drug companies, from sales reps. This is a scandal of epic proportion, and it doesn't have to be. In terms of metabolic syndrome, restricting uh, blood sugar, uh, lowering blood sugar, going into uh, as much as you can restrict your intake of blood sugar spiking foods, the foods we talk about all the time, the chips and the cereals and the, uh, and the breads and the pastas and the potatoes and the fruits and the fruit juices and the desserts. All these foods were hardwired to love because there didn't used to be a lot of these foods around and, you, and there's a need for sugar. Sugar is one of the ways we make serotonin, by the way. Insulin uh, insulin and serotonin are, uh, are, are coping hormone, which is what serotonin is. It's a coping hormone. It's a daytime hormone. It's a hormone that lets us adjust to the, vic the, the vicissitudes, the ups and the downs of life. That's a serotonin issue. Serotonin is not a happy hormone. It's a, a coping hormone. Depressed people don't get happy when they take serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They can just cope better. Well, it turns out that the more sugar and insulin we eat, the, the more serotonin we make up to a certain point. Serotonin deficiencies, because we're all stressed out, is very, are very common. So one of the reasons why we're addicted to sugar and insulin is because we're self-medicating to make our serotonin go up. That's why a little bit of sugar is important. And by little bit, I'm talking complex sugars, not necessarily super sweet sugars. I'm talking vegetable sugars. You know, vegetables have sugars in them, very important sugars. Vegetables are a rich source of carbohydrates, very important carbohydrates for serotonin, for energy, and, and we do need a little bit of, of sugar. This is, what, this is where the addiction to sugar comes from. There's hard wiring in the body, in the brain, to, to go, ha, have us not be able to resist sugar. Unfortunately, over the last 200 years, our food supply has become very, very dense with sugar. So... Restricting the amount of sugar you eat, caloric restriction, making sure you're using your electrical nutrients, your B vitamins, chromium and vanadium. This is one of Dr. Wallach's brilliant insights, chromium and vanadium. Chromium in particular is part of something called the GTF, the glucose tolerance factor. The GTF is a complex of chemicals of, of nutrients, really, including chromium and niacin, vitamin B3, that help the body process glucose. So chromium, very, very important for helping the body process nutrients or process sugar. And it's not found in a lot of foods. That's your sweeties. Vanadium also potentizes the insulin response. It resensitizes cells to insulin. It resensitizes the garage door to the garage door opener, as we said yesterday. And then there's the fatty nutrients. It's not just the watery nutrients, the electrolytes and the B vitamins and vitamin C. Oh, yeah, vitamin C. Don't forget about that one. That one's just good for everything. But it's also the fatty nutrients. DEEK, particularly D and A and E. D and A are really interesting when it comes to building. They're summertime vitamins too. D and A are summertime vitamins because you get D from the sun and you get A from animals. You have to hunt to get A from an evolutionary standpoint, and you have to have sun to get D. A and D are summertime nutrients. They go along with sugar, and not surprisingly, they help you process sugar. And A and D deficiencies are very common as well. And then there's vitamin E. We're going to talk a lot about vitamin E in the coming days because that one's stupendously important. You know, I remember when I was in pharmacy school in the early 1980s, they used to laugh at vitamin E. Vitamin E was a poster child for the stupidity of nutritional supplementation, supposed stupidity of nutritional supplementation. Folks, we've come a long, long way when, when there's a show like this where we just talk about nutritional supplements on the radio. Because nutritional supplementation 30 years ago, when I was in pharmacy school, 35, uh, 33, 34 years ago, it was considered a joke by the medical model. If you think it's considered a joke now, back then it was really considered the, the realm of quacks, uh, the wacky realm of quackery. And vitamin E was a poster child for that. Pharmacy school professors used to laugh at vitamin E. In fact, there was no really even recommended daily allowance, RDA, for vitamin E until the 90s. Vitamin E was, was considered to be a, a silly nutrient, despite the fact we've known about its importance for heart disease in particular, probably a lot to do with this whole sugar metabolism thing. We've known about it for 50 or 60 or even 70 years, but they still laughed at it. They still thought it was silly. Today, of course, we know it's vitally, vitally important for a lot of reasons. All right, 844-236-6010 is our number. Robert in Colorado. What's up, man? Welcome, welcome back to The Bright Side. How you doing? I'm doing great. 
great. Yes, what's going on? How, uh, Skinny oh, Robert. Well, is this, uh, actually, this you're is, talking to, yeah, this is Skinny Robert. Skinny Robert, okay. talking about me with uh, that uh, serotonin and chocolate. <laughs> that, that's right. That's classic. Yep, yep. Chocolate yeah. also has another compound in it called phenylethylamine, or PEA, P. And P has a reputation for being a love chemical. It's also a, a, a chemical that... Uh, it is very satisfying from a brain neurotransmitter standpoint. You can actually get PEA on Amazon.com, which is the active ingredient in chocolate. So if you want to get the active, uh, the active stuff in chocolate or one of the active stuffs in chocolate, there's a lot of acti activity in chocolate, get yourself some PEA. Not that I'm suggesting it or recommending it because it is pretty medicinal stuff. But if you are so uh, interested. Uh, anyway, what's going on? How you doing, man? How can we I'm help you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, I ran into a uh, good friend. He's a, he's in his early 80s. Okay. And done all the things in, in a great portion of uh, position in life. However, okay. he's running around with a little tube in his nose. And he's got uh -huh. COPD, and he can't stay okay. here in Colorado. He has to go back to his place in Palm Springs. You know, that's an awful curse, COPD, and emphysema, and lung disease, and all these things where you don't get oxygen. That, that's basically what COPD is. It's, it's, an right. oxygen, it's an oxygen issue, so you've got to have an oxygen tank. Can right. you imagine, you, you, you go around suffocating, basically. Do you ever, you know, try and hold your breath for a little bit, and what you'll notice when you hold your breath is there's a point where you absolutely cannot hold your breath anymore, right? Right. Well, imagine staying at that point. Yeah. Can you can you imagine being stuck at that point? What happens? Most of us, if we hold our breath, we'll, our, we reach a certain point after 10 seconds or 15 seconds or 20 or 30, whatever it is, where our brain says, you better breathe, and it makes these alarm bells go off in your head. And if you continue to hold your breath, that those alarm bells, that distress signal becomes louder and louder and louder. Well, if you have CB, COPD or emphysema, you're in, stuck in that state. We can all breathe, or, or most of us can breathe if we go to that, you know, hit that point. But when you have COPD, you can't. Yeah. Can you imagine that? What a curse that is! And, and it's funny you said he was successful in all these other ways. Probably he's financially set and all that yeah. stuff. What good does that do you? <laughs> you know, that's a great. Uh, that's a very, very important story or a very important point. Is that we focus on all of these external things to uh, to make to to portray success in our life or to make ourselves feel successful, and then we can't breathe. Robert, don't go away. I'll, we'll talk I'll COPD when we come back. All right, I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side. We'll be back right after this with more good health information. Don't go away. Okay, we're back on The Bright Side. I am Pharmacist Ben. Thanks for joining us. 844-236-6010 is our number. We're talking to Skinny Robert in Colorado. Looks like it's just me and you, buddy. Okay. Skinny Robert. <laughs> so, uh... So isn't that a curse? This guy's got, he's got everything, you know, he's yeah. financially set and, you know, probably got great family and great big house and he's living, living the dream and he can't yep. breathe and he's suffocating. Yep. Here's yeah. the deal. You know, COPD, not surprisingly, incidence is, incidences of CBD, uh, the incidence of COPD is increasing, not surprisingly. Here's the problem with COPD. It's as much a blood disease as it is a lung disease. Now, doctors will tell you it's a lung issue and it's not reversible or poorly reversible is how they put it. And that's because the lungs are damaged. Is, was this guy a smoker, by the way? I don't know you him don't know. that well. Okay. Um, well, there's a relationship between smoking and lung damage and inflammation of the mechanics of the breathing process. And that's, you know, that's where doctors typically tend to focus. That's where smoking comes in, and air pollution, and coal. If you're working in a, you know, in a fossil fuel type of setup, or a grain can do it. Gluten, believe it or not, can be involved. Gluten from breathing gluten. Mm -hmm. uh, you end up with inflammation inside the lungs, and your ox your blood doesn't get oxygenated. But you know what? There's also a blood component, clogged, dirty blood, and this is something we do have control over. So, if for folks dealing with COPD. You want to make sure you clean the blood and you practice all of the anti-inflammatory strategies we talk about on this program. Anything that exacerbates inflammation, whether it's cigarette smoke or air pollution or foreign debris that you're breathing or, or, uh, or uh, uh, cigarette smoke, whatever it is, anything inflammatory. Anything inflammatory in the lungs is going to disturb uh, lung health and lung chemistry. However... Inflammatory foods can do it, too. Allergens can do it, too. Anything that's leaking through, getting into the blood through a leaky gut can do it, too. And we have control over that. Sugar is big-time blood clotting. 
and blood clogging. So 